our scripture verse today is from the from Colossians, the first chapter, verses 15 through 20, can be found on page 1182 of your pew Bibles. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Hear these words. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been, been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of, and he is the, head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him and reconcile to him all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. I have a message for you this morning entitled, Nine Desperate Words. Now, before I begin, I wanted to share with you about the upcoming Pataskala Cemetery Walking Tour. Now that doesn't on first blush seem all that exciting, but let me tell you more about it. Next Sunday at October the 1st from 2 to 4, uh, you can purchase tickets to go on the walking tour, and folks in the community actually portray different people who are buried there. I remember Suzanne Lanfear Hayes did one last year, and Chuck Hagee is going to be doing one this year. And let me tell you about some of the people that they're going to be portraying. Tommy Alsup, who was a former slave who lived on the Abe Miller farm on Creek Road. Chuck Hagee is playing Colonel John Allward, a member of a pioneer family and a colonel in the Ohio militia. Dr. Lloyd Bell, a physician in Pataskala in the early 1900s. Leverett Butler, who was a deacon known as the King of the Hunters in his time in the early 1800s. I bet he was a character. Let me skip down to this guy. George Lynn, AKA Santa Claus. Now, what I'm about to tell you is, sounds like I'm making it up, but it's the honest-to-God true thing. So this guy played Santa Claus one Christmas at the Presbyterian Church, and he got too close to the candles, and it lit the fire, and it lit his suit on fire, and it burned him up, and it killed him. Now, if he were a Methodist, he would have been smart enough to take the suit off when it caught on fire, but I guess the Presbyterians weren't aware that they should take it off. Anyway, also, they didn't know about the stop, drop, and roll thing that we know today. But, so we feel bad for George Lynn. I feel like putting flowers on his grave just to... Anyway, so he burned up as Santa Claus, but we'll hear about him. And then Jessie B. McFadden, first female postmistress at the Pataskala Post Office, and her granddaughter is actually going to play her. So all that is very cool, and you can purchase tickets up through Saturday, September 30th, and then next Sunday in the afternoon, you can watch our friends play these characters, and it will be fun. Okay, so nine desperate words. May we pray. Dear Lord, focus us now on your Bible message that we heard Pastor Mark read moments ago. May the words leap from the pages of history directly into our hearts and souls and minds so that we might truly meet our full potential by being the people that you created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nine desperate words, and I've heard them and you've heard them as you visit with friends and family. I'm sure you've heard them as many times as I have. People say with exclamation in their voices, with, with a fever pitch, almost with desperation. They say, I've have, I have got to get control of my, I have got to get control of my life. I have, I've just got to get control of my life. Let's count that. I've just got to get control of my life. My little friend had me kind of nervous that I didn't do the right numbers. That's right. Yeah, anyway, nine words. The bottom line is we've got to get control. We feel like we have got to get control. How do we get control of our lives? It's a, uh, desperation that seems to bubble up from inside and spill out at various occasions. And really, friends, it's the reverse, isn't it? When we say that, what we're really saying is we feel that other people, places, problems are really controlling us. And so when we feel that other people have a vice grip on us clamping down, we feel as though others are controlling us. So the way that we respond is to say, I wish I could, or you wish you could, or we wish we could control our lives. Now, as I listen to people, 
all different backgrounds and walks of life and ages. I find that this phrase comes from people, whether they are Christian or non-Christian. There seems to be no difference between how people respond to circumstances in life. And it makes me question, why? Why is that possible? Just this last week, I was talking to folks from all different age groups and, and people who are aware of, of youngsters who are facing these same types of issues. And it seems as though there's no other way out for people than to give up and think, you know what, I've just got to take myself out. And so we find young people of all ages uh, having to deal with this idea of suicide and what, what's, what am I going to do next? And now I just have to give up and quit. And it's because these feelings of pressure and problems and depression make us feel as though we just can't control what's going on. We have no control of our lives. Desperation that we all felt from time to time. But the difference is this, friends. When we invite Jesus to come into our lives and we become Christians, there is a separation then between what we could feel, what we should feel, and what we do feel. If we have connected to Jesus, then we take on a, a higher level of faithfulness that hopefully changes our perspective. In other words, our minds, our personalities, our, um, our viewpoint is realigned. It should be um, shifted so that we look and deal and act differently than we would if we had not asked Jesus to come in and live within us. So I put together just a few points that hopefully will help us as we deal with this idea of getting control of our lives. The first point is this. And I think the pathology of the first point in reverse shows us how to live health in a healthy, constructive way as a Christian. And the first point is this. We have a constricted Christ. Now you and I know that Jesus Christ is not his name, right? Jesus is his name, but Christ is not his last name. Christ it was not his birth name. Christ is a title that we bestow upon him. Christ as the Messiah, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Jesus the Christ, he was referred to in the first century. Not Jesus Christ, but Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One of God. And so when we think about him that way, Christ is constricted in a lot of people's lives. It means he's bound up, he's chained up. J.B. Phillips wrote a book some years ago, and he asked this question. He posed this question. Is your God too small? Perhaps our Christ is too small. Perhaps we have him constricted and chained up and locked up inside of us. But maybe we keep him in the stained glass windows of our sanctuaries or through glib, pious theological phrases. And as we leave churches, wherever that church might be, we leave him behind, as opposed to realizing that Jesus Christ within us is our hope of glory, is our hope for help, is our hope to take that next step of faith. And so we don't leave him here hanging from the rafters or in our stained glass windows or in our theological talk. No, 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 no. We take the Lord with us out into the world in our hearts to help us each new day. Perhaps our Jesus is too constricted and chained up and locked down and we don't realize his willingness and his desire to be with us on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. Because when you loosen the Lord within you and ask God to take control, ask Jesus to take control in your life, then we won't have to feel as though we have to be in control. And that's why we put on the front cover of your bulletin, and for those who are watching online or who are listening by radio, they, they perhaps have not seen it, but if you click online, you can see it at our website, I'm sure, but it's a picture of a military change of command. And it shows two commanders supervised by a four-star general as the change of command happens. The banner of the troop is then transferred to the next commander. Perhaps some of you have seen that happen. Perhaps when we're, or our Jesus is too locked up and too constricted, we don't realize that we must loosen, let him free within us and say, Lord, we don't have to be in control of our lives. We ask you to be in control. And in fact, we are going to invite you to be in control. And we volitionally, on purpose, change command from ourselves to you. After all, that was God's plan, wasn't it? Not that we be in complete control of everything, but that Jesus take control. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, guide us on a day-to-day basis. The first point is perhaps our 
Jesus is too constricted and we need to loose him in our lives. Second point is this. We have a worthy Christ. He is worthy. The Bible says the word... When we think about the word, we often think about the Bible. You'll hear, you'll, you will hear people say, well, are you following the word? Do you believe the word? And all this type of thing. Are you living the word, brother? Are you living the word, sister? They misunderstand this concept of the Bible. Of course, we respect the Bible. We believe the Bible is the, is the inspired word of God. But way back in the first century, they had no idea what the Bible was. It didn't exist. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years later, it did not exist. So if we were to go back in time and say to the disciples, hey, what does your Bible say? Are you living by the word? They would look at us with a blank stare like, what are you talking about? Are you insane? What, what are you talking about? The Bible did not exist. So when we, the scripture I'm about to, to quote for you takes on new meaning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We're talking about Jesus, the pre-existent Christ, the uncreated Christ. Christ was not created. He was co-equal with God. In existence from the beginning. The creator of universes within universes. A worthy Christ that we worship and that we ask to take control of our lives. The pre-existent, non-created, creator of universes within universes. I said that again for you just to try to let it sink in. The Jesus that we think of as our friend, as the good shepherd, was the one who breathe life into creation. The magnitude of, of who he is should take root within us. We should be conscious of that. And therefore, isn't it a relief to realize we don't have to have answers for everything. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to be in control of everything. We can take a deep breath and say, Lord, we believe you are in control and you are helping us. We reach out to you on purpose and we ask you, God, to help us. You are worthy. And we say, help us. A restaurant that I frequent in the community has a sign on the wall, and it reads this way. Friends don't let friends do stupid things, dot, 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 alone. And the more you think about that, the funnier it'll be. Friends don't let friends do stupid things alone. Isn't it nice that we don't have to be alone? We don't have to just feel like we're in this solitary confinement, and we don't know what to do, but we have to come up with an answer somehow. The good news is it's not just up to us, but you have a worthy friend, a good shepherd, but one who existed before time and eternity to help breathe knowledge and goodness, intelligence, hope, faith into you to help you make the right decisions and to do the right thing. Sometimes, friends, our God is constricted. Jesus is too small for you and for me. We need to loose him and let him take full control of our lives. Secondly, we realize that he is worthy. Not only to give our praise and thanksgiving, as the Bible tells us, but also to say, Lord, take control of my life. You know what you're doing. Together, we can make this happen. Together. In fact, friends, the only way you can live to your full potential, the only way I might live to my full potential is the living Lord Jesus within you, helping us live to our full potential. The difference between a, a Christian and a non-Christian is that we have asked the Lord Jesus to come in and take control of our lives, and we say, help us, Lord. We don't have to do this on our own. We don't have to try to figure it out on our own. But you are going to guide us every step of the way, and we say, Lord, help us in Jesus' name. So sometimes we have too constricted of a Christ. We have a worthy Christ. And then lastly, friends, we have an able Christ. Christ is able. No less than eight times within the New Testament do we find the he is able phrase. Sometimes said by Paul, the apostle, sometimes said by Jude, sometimes said by a lot of different people. Eight times within the New Testament. He is able. Now that word able is taken from the Greek word for dunamis, which means power. So when you read the apostle Paul saying he is able, or you read one of the other disciples, say, he is able. That sounds kind of a wimpy, lackluster phrase, doesn't it? He is able. There's even that nice song that's so melodic. He is able, said the master, da-da-da-da-da. And the question, are you able? It's kind of a 
peaceful, melodic, are you able to be crucified with me? Really, that's an innocuous, wimpy kind of a term. What they're really saying is, when they say he is able, they're saying he has the power to live within you and me and take us to that next level of faith and faithfulness. We have an able, powerful Christ. Several years ago, maybe four or five years ago now, a movie, Lincoln, hit the silver screen, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, won a lot of Academy Awards. A couple of interesting scenes in that one, but the one that's particularly useful for us today. The president is trying to get a piece of legislation through Congress, and so it show, this movie shows him making deals with the various members of the Senate and the House to uh, pass the legislation. And at a certain point when the vote is happening, um, there, a, the aides come to President Lincoln and say, Mr. President, we've got to offer this job to so-and-so and this thing to so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, President Lincoln gets so exasperated and so frustrated. And he looks at his aides and he says, do these people not know that the President of the United States is clothed in immense power. And of course, he was attempting to express to these people, do they not know the power I have to help them or to destroy them? Now, if it is true, as we have often heard said, that the President of the United States is the most powerful person in the world, if that, if that were true, that is such an infinitesimal, itty-bitty, tiny, drop in the bucket compared to the power of Almighty God, the immense power of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the world and in your life and in my life. Power to equip us for daily living. Power to help us reach our full potential. Power to help us get through difficulties and depressions and discouragements that we all face, no matter what our age. We could be in first grade or anywhere in between that all the way through college, or we could be of advanced age, and there is no difference between the pressures and the problems that we face. They may seem different, they may seem less than, depending on the age, but for the person, it's just as important and just as powerful as any other kind of problem people face. The difference, however, should be friends. Those who are Christians should have the help that perhaps the non-Christians just don't have yet because we have the help of Jesus within us. And maybe we need to remind ourselves that. And we need to remind others around us of that. Listen, you're a Christian. You believe in the Lord Jesus. You've asked him to come into your heart. You have immense power within you to face the problems that you're facing. You have immense power within you to rise above and to be exactly who God created you to be. So the nine desperate words about, I've just got to get control of my life, it dawned on me the other night about two in the morning laying in bed, and it occurred to me, ah, I know the problem. The problem for that exclamation is, when we say we need to get control of our lives, it's because we already have control of our lives. And we just want to have more control. And that's the problem. If we're in control of our lives, we have a finite amount of intelligence. No matter how smart we may be, no matter how many degrees we might have, no matter how successful we might be, no matter how great we are, and I believe we're all just terrific, there still comes a point where we are finite. We have a limited ability, limited energy, limited intelligence, limited resources, where we hit the wall, and there's just nothing else we can do. We've reached the end of our ability. And that's why we have to change command and say, Lord Jesus, come in. Live within me. Come into my heart. If we haven't done that in just a moment or two, I'm going to invite you as we have our closing prayer, those of you who are here and those of you who are listening or watching, to invite the Lord Jesus into our hearts. To say, Lord, come in and live within me. Or to rededicate ourselves to God and say, Lord, I just, I realize that I just can't do it on my own. I, I wish I could. I thought I could. I, I'm a reasonably smart, intelligent person, but I just, I can't do it anymore. And the good news is when we reach that step, it's such a beautiful place to be because we finally come to the realization that we can't, but God can. And we say, Lord, help us. We, we take the chains away. We loose you in our lives. And we say, Lord, you're no longer constricted to one compartmentalized part of our lives. You're no longer just there. We're going to put you on the shelf on Sunday morning, and that's it. And we come to church, and then we say we're done. No, we, we, that's just a starting point. We're going to loosen you up and say, Lord, come in and take full control of my life because you are worthy 
You existed before time. And your power is immense. And it's hard sometimes, let's just be honest, it's hard for a human finite being to wrap our minds around that. It is almost impossible for us to wrap our mind. How could somebody that, that existed before time immemorial, that, someone who breathed life into universes upon universes, care about you and me individually? So let's just agree that we can't grasp it, and let's just believe it. Yes, Lord, we can't totally grasp that, but we thank you for it. Thank you for loving us that much to want to be a personal friend to us and to know and care about us. We have a worthy Christ, and then we have a powerful Christ, dunamis power, power to create, power to heal, power to forgive, power to refresh. And that power gives you and me in this moment the ability to live to our full potential, to conquer any problem, any situation that's out there, this week or next or the next, or any other time in our unknown tomorrows, because the Lord God, the King of Kings, is with you. And that gets us back to the scripture that I was telling our young friends about this morning. From Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Christ in our hearts, or some translations say Christ in you, the hope of glory. Your hope and my hope comes not from an idea, not from a theological concept, not from the beautiful stained glass, not from a book. The hope for you and me comes from the Word made flesh who dwelt among us and who is alive and well today. His name is Jesus, and he is ready, willing, and able to help you right where you are at the point of your need now. May we pray. And so, Lord Jesus, in this moment, we come to a critical point, a crucial point in our lives, where we realize we uh, can only go so far. We can only do so much, and we become incapable. And we say, Lord Jesus, in this moment, come in and live within us. We invite you personally into our hearts. Come and live within us. Take up residence. We want to believe in you. We want to follow you. We want to be Christians. And then, Lord, may your Holy Spirit well up inside of us so that we might truly feel your presence and walk in newness of life, in a refreshed life, in a realigned thinking, personality reshaped, ready to be your person. We know sometimes in life we wish we might have been born in some other time or some other place, or if we could, if we could somehow take a time machine back to do things differently. And yet we realize in this moment that you have created us and you could have put us in history at any time. You could have plopped us down in history at any point in, 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 from the first century to today. And yet you chose us to live now for a purpose and for a reason. We want to live that purpose. We want to be the people you've created us to be. And so, Lord Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, guide us into our unforeseen, unknown tomorrows to be the people you created us to be for 21st century America that you've created us to live in. Or wherever you might send us, Lord, wherever we might reside, you've created us for this specific time. Help us to realize that and to live our potential. And then, Lord Jesus, if we've done that, if we've already accepted you, we've realized who you are, we've had you come into our hearts, perhaps we've reached that time where, where it kind of has become rusty. Our faith is up on a shelf collecting dust. We take the, the faith off the shelf, we dust it off, and we say, Lord, we want to rededicate our lives to you, and we do so now. We sign up yet again to be your people, to be a believer in you. Thank you for helping us. We receive your gift of forgiveness, salvation, renewal, and now power to live the lives that you've made us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.